Good evening and welcome to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage here of general election 2020. I'm here with the candidates for the Winiski House seat. We have Hal Colston, who is our current representative, and we have Taylor Small, and we have James Ellers. There are two seats, we have three candidates, and I want to remind folks that over the course of this forum, this virtual forum, democracy, streaming democracy, um, we will be happy to take your calls at 802-862-3966. So for the first question, I'm gonna start with the incumbent, Hal Colston, and ask you, Hal, welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you. What qualifies you and why are you running? Well, first of all, I want to thank Channel 17 and Lauren Glenn Davidian for hosting this forum. Um, I look forward to this um, each and every uh, moment that we can do this. Um, well, I uh, served my first term and it has been a great uh, uh, learning curve and, and a way to figure out how I can make a difference. Uh, one of my achievements uh, in the first, my first biennium was to uh, put in place Act 10, which is a, uh, an act for foreign um, verification of credentials. And it is a, a law now that allows for the Office of uh, Professional Regulation to, uh, to kind of approach verifying and vetting professionals in a different way, in a more efficient way, which is allowing uh, more of our new American professionals who have practiced their craft for 20, 30 years in their home country and come here and have to start at square zero, basically. So this uh, is exciting. Um, I think about 10 people have, have gone through thus far and it's allowing for um, our uh, you know, important jobs to be filled. Uh, I'm focusing on three things. Uh, You're almost out of time here, so hurry up. Yep. En en engaging Vermont um, and all our residents into our public process. I believe in a livable wage. I believe that no one should be able to uh, draw from public assistance if they work full time. We need to change that and racial justice. Very good. You'll have more time to talk about these issues that are of concern to you. Thank you for that opening statement. Taylor Thank Small, you. why don't we go with you um, to tell us why you're running for the Winiski House seat and what qualifies you for the position. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lauren Glenn. And of course, thank you to CCTV for having us here today. What qualifies me for running in this position is understanding those most impacted here in the state. From my work in the mental health field, as well as working within community at the Pride Center of Vermont, I've seen the ways that our system isn't able to support everyone in the way that it currently is set up and understanding that the bills that are created are not thinking of those most impacted or thinking about the impact on environment. And so I'm excited to bring my perspective and a new, young, fresh voice into the State House to make sure that we can make the change that we have always talked about. We see Vermont as a progressive state and a leader in a majority of ways. And I hope to continue pushing us on in that same direction and trying to fill the big shoes that Representative Deanna Gonzalez is leaving behind. But I think I, I'm up for the task. Very good. Thank you very much, Taylor Small. James Eller, you're joining us by, by phone. Um, you're running for the House seat as an independent for District 6-7. Tell us why you're running and what qualifies you. Yes, hi, uh, Lauren. Thank you, Channel 17. Uh, my name is James Ellers. I live on West Canal, and I'm running as an independent. I was inspired by supporters and uh, neighbors, and several factors motivated me to undertake this campaign. The economic injustices laid bare by COVID-19, the passing of John Lewis, the unacceptable political hatred that we're all experiencing, the callousness of politicians embracing Vermont's war-dependent economy, but perhaps none more important than my belief that we're all entitled to representation that answers to us, rooted solely in our shared humanity, rooted in love. Not based on how much money we have or which party we identify with or on our utility to out-of-state special interests and corporations, 
and certainly not based on where we were born or whether our parents were black, brown, or white. With a long history in our community and state as a fighter for those of us downstream, I'll do more than offer platitudes. I'll fight for you and your loved ones. For as we know, power concedes nothing without a demand. My pledge to you and your children is an empowered voice for all of us to believe there are better days ahead. When our skies are free from nuclear weapon equipped warplanes, when our air is clean and our water safe, when our wages and benefits are just, giving us access to secure housing, child care, elder care, and even our own health care. Beautiful. As your brother, Thank you, James. Neighbor, and co-worker and dad of four school-age children, I believe we're all essential, all deserving of dignity. Thank you. All right, Taylor Small, my apologies for mis misnaming you. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to the next question, which is what will be different uh, because you've become a legislator a year from now? What, what kind of changes do you think you will be able to affect? A minute and a half. Thank you. Was that starting with me, Lauren Klein? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. I wasn't clear. Starting well, with you, Taylor Small. No worries. No worries. Thank you. So what's going to change in the coming year um, and two years? I think in, in the sense of filling the shoes, as I said, of Representative Deanna Gonzalez, I think we're gonna continue to see this progressive change in the House. But I think one of my core issues that I am focused on is healthcare reform and making sure that our healthcare is not connected, our healthcare insurance is not connected to employment. And seeing the devastating results of COVID-19 and the pandemic, both here in Winooski and across the state, it's devastating to think that someone could lose their job and then not be able to take care of their health afterwards. I think a strong move that we need to make in our state is for a single payer healthcare system that is putting Vermonters at the forefront and making sure that health is not a choice, but is a right that everyone here is able to access. I think so strongly that there is, a, when we think of healthcare, that it intersects with a majority of the issues that we're talking about. When we're thinking about racial justice and the way that our healthcare systems are currently not set up to support folks who are not white. We're thinking about the ways that we can change our environment to put health as the initial impact and understanding that the devastating things that we are doing in our country and in our state are having significant health impacts on everyone in our communities. So I think reforming our healthcare system is at the forefront for me and really highlighting that there is so much more we can do in protecting our neighbors. Thank you very much. James Ellers, we're gonna go next to you on what will change because you become a representative from the city of Winooski next year at this time. Thank you, Lauren. First, I, I guess I'll just say I'm a person of unshakable conviction. Uh, that was probably partially formed uh, by my time uh, as a Naval officer, but also extraordinary empathy and bringing those two together I'll be able to bring the fighting spirit for which I'm known for justice to Montpelier on behalf of Winooski. Taylor could certainly count on me as an ally in health care reform uh, that's desperately needed uh, but I've had experience as a advocate in Montpelier over the last 25 years uh, passing good legislation from finish, to, uh, from finish to end, as well as passing a Senate resolution uh, banning nuclear weapons at the Burlington Airport, a, a resolution that people said could not get done. We got it done. And I've also helped defeat bad legislation. So I already, I already have an enormous amount of legislative experience, and that coupled with a uh, independence, not beholden to any particular party leadership, only answering to the people of Winooski, I think they will see an immediate impact. Thank you very much. Hal Colston, what will change because you return to the legislature next year? Well, I've been working in a process since um, June. Um, we, we actually recessed and then we got back in session in August. Um, on bringing new voices to the table. Uh, racial justice is an enormous issue that we face in Vermont. 
I believe Vermont is going through its civil rights era at this moment. You know, people of color, like myself, African Americans, are no longer asking for change, we're demanding change. So I was uh, able to join other legislators. We, we hosted three statewide hearings. We heard from a number of Vermonters who normally would not participate in the process about what is their best thoughts and thinking about what's needed for achieving racial justice. So the Social Equity Caucus, which is a new caucus um, that I helped uh, roll out um, last August, uh, will be standing up a working group. And we have selected 14 Vermonters, and these are not the usual suspects, who will be coming together over the next few months and to give us their best thinking about policy that we should consider for achieving racial justice. So this will be an important resource for the legislature, the Senate and the House, to help shape our thinking around crafting bills to achieve racial justice. So this is a new and different way for getting and engaging Vermonters in our process. Thank you very much. We'll talk a little bit more about racial justice a little later on. Let me um, start with you, James, for the next question, which is about the budget. What's your assessment of the FY22 budget? And what is your recommended approach to meet the needs and or balance and or reduce? Well, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, very well. I think they can just turn up your volume in the studio also if it's a problem. Yeah, it's just, it's um, obviously there, there's some drawbacks to not being able to participate in uh, video. Uh, so uh, the next budget, the next budget we, we've all heard uh, is pretty, uh, I, I don't like, I don't like to be, to think of myself as a person of doom and gloom, but we've, we've heard some pretty scary stories out of Montpelier already about coming budgets and budget years. And I think the solution to our pressing budget needs are what they've always been. And that is, we need to tax the folks who are most privileged in this state, who get to enjoy all the benefits of living here that most of us only wish we could participate in. I mean, we tout microbreweries and skiing, and most of us cannot afford to participate in that type of Vermont. So I am going to be advocating, as I have been for years, uh, either for a permanent wealth tax or a temporary wealth tax to make sure that Winooski, in particular, is taken care of, because it's totally unjust for people to be offered nothing more than thanks for doing the essential work that others will not do to keep Vermont moving through this pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, so Taylor, tell us about your approach to the FY22 budget, please. I agree. And knowing that where we really need to move is progressive tax reform and actually taxing equitably across income and especially uh, dividends and the ways that they're showing up for folks. In, in thinking about this campaign and being able to talk with Vermonters here, folks who have this wealth or have the availability to pay more into the system are saying that they want to because they have the same vision and dream for a future Vermont that is able to actually support and take care of everyone. So thinking of the folks here in Winooski that are able to contribute and want to contribute, it is a destination and a direction that we can go in. I think even reflecting on the gubernatorial debates here, we heard our governor saying that taxing the top 5% would, would chew people out of Vermont or they would go elsewhere. And I don't think that's the case because when we think of folks who are committed to Vermont and committed to their communities, they are willing and if they are able, will contribute more. Thank you very much. Cal, can you hear me okay? I just had to get the headphones on. Yeah. Sure, uh, I hear you. Yeah, tell us about your approach to the FY22 budget. And uh, sure. what, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I, I actually agree with James and, and Taylor um, about the wealth tax. I think that's really important. But I think more important is we need to take this on in a different way. 
we're in the middle of a pandemic like we've never seen before. And it's affecting everything that we do that, that, that delivers resources to our community. So I think House Appropriations has always done a great job with a listening tour, going around the state and listening to Vermonters. And I think we need to do that um, with, with, with a deeper probe and to make sure we're understanding the values that we stand for as Vermont. Because a budget is a moral document and we need to make different choices. We need to be creative in all kinds of ways to make our budget work. We're very fortunate that our FY21 budget is pretty much intact as it's been, but it's gonna be a real challenge with FY22. And I think we have to be uh, very creative and we have to really understand what are the needs of Vermonters and how do we best address them. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna use this opportunity to um, insert a question that was sent to us um, and it's directed at Taylor, but I, I just like everybody to take an opportunity to answer this. Um, it's about who you're going to caucus with. And so, Taylor, you're, you um, did not run in the uh, progressive primary, you ran in the Democratic primary. The, the caller asked, your materials show that you will, and you have said you will ally with the and caucus with the progressive. There's no real mention of the Democrats, yet you're running in the Democratic primary. Does this seem fair? Great question. So in running as a fusion candidate, both progressive and democratic, I ran in the democratic primary because the hope is, is that there will be coalition building and collaboration. And understanding that when it comes to caucusing, I do plan on caucusing with the progressive uh, caucus, but I'm not opposed and would actually enjoy also caucusing with the democratic party and understanding that there is a lot of alignment there and movements where we can keep going and making sure that we're holding on to those progressive values. And I think I'm already creating those connections with folks who are serving now and are set to serve uh, come January, as well as folks who are both fusion candidates, just like myself, who are vying for their spots and will be in the house here shortly. Thank you. Cal, who um, do you caucus with? I, I will continue caucusing if I'm elected with the Democratic Caucus. Um, I think we have a very strong platform that, that meets the needs of, of Vermonters. We were very uh, excited to uh, overturn the governor's veto for uh, an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, I think we need to do a lot more work there. And um, we certainly made some, some strong efforts uh, with getting through uh, a, an environmental bill that I think is going to finally hold our state accountable to reaching its goals. So I will continue caucusing with the Democrats. And what's your view of progressive caucus? Do the Dems and the progressive caucus we, together? We, we, we certainly work together on, on certain issues. Absolutely. So I think, uh, as, as I like to think of it, I think progressives are more lasered to, to some of the issues that we're trying to push through. Um, and we certainly have joined forces and, and vice versa. Thank you. James, you're running as an independent. Who would you be caucusing with? Hi, Lauren, thank you. Uh, I would caucus with whomever is in the majority. Uh, I, that, this is an area where I'm gonna disagree with Hal, and it's one of the reasons why I'm running as an independent is, uh, the Democrats have a supermajority, and I think passing a, a minimum wage bill of $15 uh, that doesn't even come to fruition for several more years is, is kind of a slap in the face to working Vermonters, especially during a pandemic. I, I work on the night shift at, at the, a grocery store handling freight, and there's no one that feels that the Democratic supermajority has been answering the needs of the working class right now, far from it. And especially me, a single dad, trying to balance uh, several jobs and childcare and homeschooling, it's untenable out here. I mean, I don't understand, I don't understand how the supermajority can move along thinking that they've done everything they could. And if the governor vetoes it, it's on him. But 
uh, I expect more from the supermajority, quite frankly, and uh, the progressives should be pushing them harder. So did you say you would join the caucus with the Democrats? I would caucus with the majority. So if that is uh, who it is come this session, yes, I would caucus with the Democrats. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go on to this question about racial equity. I'm going to start uh, with Hal Colston. And just I'm going to just remind folks that for those of you who may have just joined us, you are welcome to call. We are speaking with three candidates for the House in Winnipeg, which we have two districts, six, seven. Um, and we will take your call at 802-862-3966. So how you talk to a little bit about some significant work that the legislature is undertaking and you're involved in. Here's the question that we asked everyone in advance. Uh, Vermont passed some racial equity legislation in the past few years. Are you satisfied that Vermont and the legislature is doing enough to dismantle systemic and institutional racism in this state? And do you support reparations and apologizing for Vermont's role in slavery and systemic racism? Well, to answer your first question, I, I don't think we have done enough. Um, so I'm, I'm working hard to uh, put in place some strategies that may get us there. Uh, I do support reparations and apologizing for Vermont's role in slavery and systemic racism. Um, uh, we supported Prop 2, which has changed some of the language in our constitution that was very ambiguous around whether or not we had outlawed, outruled slavery or not, where we had in fact uh, endorsed indentured servitude for, for people of color. So, so that's, that's a, a process that will take several years. We got through the first hurdle. But more importantly, I am looking to stand up through legislation with a bill that I'd be working on with a colleague to create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Vermont. So that would involve other partners who would essentially fund it through, through grants that are available out there around the country. And until we have a serious conversation about the harm that we have all experienced through systemic and institutional racism, we can't get our heads wrapped around reparations. And I think that's the process that Vermont needs now and I'm willing to step up and lead that effort and put in place a law that makes that happen. Thank you very much. James Ellers, what's your view on this question of Vermont's role in systemic racism and the steps the legislature has taken to address? Do you think they've gone far enough and you support reparations and apologizing for our role in slavery? Well, first, um, as uh, obviously a, a white man, I'm going to start by offering an apology to uh, my black brothers and sisters, brown brothers and sisters, people of all color, uh, for Vermont's role in slavery. Uh, it's been particularly bothersome to me that we have sort of glossed over the fact that slavery existed here uh, for quite a long time, even after we supposedly eliminated it in our Constitution, while people look the other way, involving even Supreme Court justices. So this is one area uh, where I, I hold Hal in, in, in high regard and admiration. And I, I do not believe we've done nearly enough as uh, someone with uh, interracial relatives in my family. This is an issue that is personally uh, important to me, and it's also just important to me on a very basic level of human dignity. Um, I would look forward to talking to Hal about what we could do to explore starting by taking legal action against the corporations that have financially benefited the most over the years particularly the tobacco industry comes to mind, uh, and the textile industry. Uh, and those fortunes have been passed on from generation to generation. So I, I think there's a role for starting uh, with reparations at that level. 
for now. Thank you very much. Taylor Small, your view of this question of Vermont's role in racism, the legislature's role, have you gone far enough to politics and reparations are in this way? Great question. And I think just fundamentally, when we think about systemic racism or institutionalized racism, it is racism that is embedded within the system and just uh, continued on by the folks who are participating in it. So have we gone far enough? No, because we're still here having this conversation, which is recognizing the fact that racism is alive and well, even here in the state of Vermont. And knowing that it's going to take so much more work. And I think it's beautiful that uh, Hal brings up this Truth and Reconciliation Commission and understanding that there is so much learning that we as a collective state need to understand and way more uh, inter interrogation into how our systems are actually upholding these uh, racist uh, modalities. And so, yes, I think we do need to explore reparations. Yes, I think we need to also recognize our history and slavery. And I also want to acknowledge that on Monday it was Indigenous Peoples Day. And so mm -hmm. not only have we performed slavery here, but we have also unseated the Wabanaki Confederacy and the Abenaki people from their land and still have yet to make reparations mm -hmm. for the harm that we have caused um, to our Indigenous neighbors. And so there is, again, so much work and so many bills that need to happen. And I think it is a great start to do this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and I really applaud you, Hal, on moving forward with that. And also recognizing that there is education that we need to be moving forward as well within our uh, education system and making sure that we're funding a truly diverse history that doesn't just focus on white people. Very good. Thank you very much for your frank responses. Um, James? I'm going to start with you, and the question has to do with healthcare. And um, again, what's your appraisal of the delivery of healthcare in Vermont, especially in light of COVID? And what kind of changes would you be working for if you were to go to the legislature? I'm, I'm sorry, it, was this question directed to me? Your, yes. Your break. Yes. Was okay, and the question is on the health care issue? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, well, it, uh, this is a, a wonderful question in the sense that I'm glad that you're relating it to the fact that COVID has just brought it further into focus. There has been a health care issue in this state for some time. And once again, we sort of glossed over it by the fact that we have such a high insurance coverage rate, but many of us can't access the insurance because we can't afford the deductibles. And many of those insurance plans don't include dental or vision as if our teeth and our eyes aren't important to our health. So at a minimum, I would, I would like to start with the state of Vermont offering always talking about how we want more people to move to Vermont, we want to be friendly to business, with the state of Vermont offering to all Vermont citizens the same exact coverage that the administration provides for itself. We're all essential. And the fact that some of us only get lip service when it comes to that is, um, it's, it's maddening to a lot of us, quite frankly. Uh, as, as far as the externalities of health care, well, that's not an issue I think any one of the three of us can address uh, in this legislative session, given the complexities. But at a minimum, the state of Vermont should not be letting employers exploit Vermonters who are working or who are incapable of work. Okay, thank you. Um, your view of the health care issue, you mentioned it in your opening statements. It sounds like it's an important issue for you. What do you think needs to happen next in the legislative arena around health care reform? This issue is deeply personal and really understanding that 
just four years ago, I found myself unemployed due to my identity and not able to have an income to be able to take care of my health care. There were six months of my life where I had to decide whether I had the money to be able to go and see my doctor or whether I was able to buy my food or pay my bills or pay my rent. And that should never be the case. And understanding that because of the Affordable Care Act, I was grateful and lucky enough to be able to be covered under my parents' insurance. And still, as James highlights, when we look at these deductibles and co-pays that we are expecting and forcing our communities to pay, what we see time and time again from the Department of Health is that folks are delaying their care. They're not going to see a doctor because they can't afford it. And that should never be the case. Where we need to be moving is making sure that healthcare is affordable. And the way that we do that is through a single payer healthcare system that is actually making sure that these statewide benefits are comparable to the private corporations that exist right now and are able to actually support everyone in that process and making sure that everyone has access regardless if they are connected to employment or regardless of their age. Thank you very much. We go on to how I'm just going to let everyone know that the next round you get to ask a question of the other candidates. So think about those while Hal is telling us what he thinks the future of healthcare needs to be in the state of Vermont as a legislator from Winiski. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to focus on the inequities in healthcare that have been really um, brought to light through the COVID pandemic. Um, I'm really excited about what's happening at the UVM Medical Center. I serve on their board, and I also serve on a steering committee um, that relates to equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion. And what UVM Medical Center is underway in, in making a commitment to become an anti-racist organization. That's huge. And that is a process that will take a long, long time. It's, it's about the process, it's not about the destination, but I'm really hopeful that a large institution such as that is making such a commitment. And of course, they're the, the flagship in the UVM um, health network. So my hope is that this will become a best practice and other smaller institutions can learn and understand how they too can improve healthcare outcomes by dealing with the inequities that have been baked into this system from its very beginning. So I'm very hopeful that that will be a change that we can all um, look towards and experience the benefits as Vermonters. Thank you very much. Taylor Small, why don't you start with a question for the other candidates? Thank you so much. So something that is highlighted for me is thinking about the recent protests that were happening in Burlington regarding the Burlington Police Department and uh, law enforcement oversight and just law enforcement harassment, specifically of brown and black individuals in our community. And I want to know um, uh, from both of your points of view, what does police reform look like here in the state of Vermont or what would you like to see? Thank you. This is a kind of lightning round. So, Hal, you've got a minute. Okay. What I would like to see is more citizen input. Um, and I would like to even go further that we should have a structure of citizen oversight that has power. Okay. Because the police serve us, the community. And we need to have power and able to direct how policing is done in the 21st century, so it best meets the needs of our citizens. Therefore, we need to have auxiliary support, so every, every call is not for the police. If you have someone in a mental health crisis, that's probably not a good fit for, for an officer. They're not trained to, to properly handle and mitigate those kinds of challenges. So we need to be creative, and we need to involve our community and how do we reshape policing so police are there to serve and protect, not to harm. Thank you, James. What's your view of police reform? I think you heard Taylor's question. You have a minute. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I I agree with everything Hal said. I would I would also add in that I played a role in the passage of the PTSD Workman's Comp Bill, which uh, police officers weren't being given Workman's Comp for PTSD related illnesses, um, and were either being forced out of their careers or uh, being forced to work when they were not healthy. So in addition to making sure that we have other support people for officers, if we want peace officers, which I do, instead of police officers, actual peace officers, then we also need to change our expectations of what we're asking uh, those folks to do. And that would best be done through citizen oversight with authority, because the Burlington situation certainly highlights a number of the legal complications uh, involved with trying to um, dismiss an officer that everyone felt yep. really should know. Perfect. Thank you. We have a call from the outside world. Kevin, can you um, hook us up? the candidates and I'm wondering um, as a Winooski resident um, what they think uh, they can do in their positions in order to begin to mitigate the effects of the F-35s on the community especially here in Winooski. Sounds good. We're going to start with James. How can we mitigate the effects of the F-35s? Well, while we work to relocate the F-35 to a full-time Air Force base, given the Air Force didn't even list Burlington as first choice, uh, I intend to introduce a bill uh, that is a, based on a 2013 bill introduced by then uh, Winooski Representative George Cross, which would uh, generate revenue specifically for mitigation of sound. Uh, this obviously has limitations because we all don't just live inside uh, and not all of us have access to centralized climates in our apartments or homes. But that said, uh, we can do this with a tax on air travel, which would also serve to uh, address some of the climate issues that we're facing and the air sector's contribution to carbon emissions, not to mention the military's carbon emissions. So, and then the second part of that is, uh, we, we need the Attorney General to step up on the PFAS contamination issues uh, that are polluting the groundwater. I mean, this is a carcinogen that we already know has contaminated the groundwater and the surface water in our communities. And this is a direct result of the Air National Guard's use of uh, PFAS AFFF foam. So uh, there's a number of things we can do while we continue to work to uh, give the Air Force back their F-35. Uh, okay. But I, I believe that, that that needs to start with Winooski representation. Thank you very much. Taylor Small, your approach to mitigating the effects of the F-35 on Winooski. I agree that we need to be working on a plan to relocate the F-35s out of our state and understanding the significant health impacts and just safety concerns from our neighbors here in Winooski. I've heard folks describe our beautiful city as uninhabitable or feeling as if they're living in a war zone, and that should not be the case. And understanding that it will take a lot of work, it will take strong advocates in our house and especially our higher positions and our US representatives and senators and pushing and making sure that our representation is actually for us and hearing our concerns. And so in the meantime, understanding that we should be working towards weatherization and soundproofing in homes in Winooski, not only because of the enormous sound impact of these F-35s, but because of the uh, age of the homes here in Winooski and making sure that they are habitable for all folks and making sure that housing is safe 
for all folks. And as well as reducing the number of flights that are happening currently and understanding that they are in excess and again, torturing our communities here in Winooski. Thank you. Hal Colston, how should we mitigate the F-35s in Winooski? Well, in, in terms of recent history, um, Winooski has pursued a lawsuit to prevent this from happening. We've written a Secretary of the Air Force. Um, we have petitioned our congressional delegation and have been rebuffed at all uh, efforts. So I think what's missing in this equation right now is that we need to have a seat at the airport commission. We need to have a voice. And, and that's underway, but that needs to be in place because there's no way that we can be impacted like this and don't have a voice to represent our community. I, I too believe that the noise mitigation uh, grant program is, is what we have before us. Um, there, there are some final um, decisions being made to deploy that. And I think we need to be very aggressive with getting as much of, of, of the resources as possible into our city as soon as possible to address the uh, uh, you know, soundproofing that needs to take place to make uh, people's homes as safe as possible from the noise. Um, we have time actually for closing comments. So we didn't all get a chance to ask each other questions. I hope that's okay. That was a good question. Thanks for asking. But let's go to closing comments and uh, Taylor, why don't we start with you? You've got a minute and tell us, uh, wrap it up. Tell us why the voters should come out for you on November 3rd. Thank you so much. And I think uh, a highlighting piece here when we think about our government is making sure that it is representative of the people that it serves and understanding that the way that our legislature looks right now is primarily white, it's primarily older, it's primarily straight, and primarily cisgender. And when we're thinking about having a fresh perspective, and when we're thinking about making sure that our bills are under the lens of those that are going to be most impacted, it's going to come from the voices that we elect to have serve in the legislature. So I'm proud to be running as the first out transgender woman who is going to be serving in the legislature come January and making sure that all of our voices here in Winooski and statewide are heard. Thank you very much. Taylor Smalls running as a Democrat slash progressive. Am I correct on that? Yes. And James Ellers, your closing comments, please. James Ellers is running as an independent for this seat. Find the mute button here. Yep. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to thank both the other candidates for being willing to step up and serve uh, in the legislature. I think um, I think we all probably realize at this point, I, even before stepping into another race, uh, realize just uh, what a personal toll uh, and commitment it is to do so. Uh, that said, um, I'm running as an independent, not by accident, as someone who has spent 20 something years around the state house. And I believe that we need independent thinking. There's too much groupthink that goes on. There's too much tribalism. And someone that is a dad to four school age children in the middle of a pandemic who doesn't feel that it's inhabitable because of F-35s knows it is. My kids cannot play outside. It's not okay for me or anyone else to wait 15 years for mitigation. So on day one, I will be introducing legislation to transition the guard to a peacekeeping mission away from these offensive combat roles with systems designed to carry nuclear weapons. And together with you, we can do that. We can bring the working class into the state house instead of the political class dominating the discussions as we do right now. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hal Colston, your closing comments, please. Thank you. 
I just want to say I'm, I'm really proud to serve Winooski for the past two years in the uh, legislature. Um, I am uh, hopefully uh, doing you well. I love to hear from my constituents and connect with them and problem solve. So I hope to continue doing that work as well. I think it's important to understand to get work done in that house, uh, the people's house, you know, we have to collaborate. We have to work with each other. We have to work across the aisles in order to get things done. And, and, and change, change comes in incremental ways. But as long as we have our eye on the prize and we understand our needs and where we're trying to go, I think we can all get there together. So I just want to thank again all of those who have supported me. And I really look forward to your continued support. Well, I want to thank the three of you joining us, candidates for the Winnitsky House seat, District 6-7, Taylor Small running as a Democrat progressive, Hal Colston, incumbent running as a Democrat, and James Ellers running as an independent. There are two seats, three candidates, so don't forget to come out either before November 3rd and vote or come out on November 3rd and vote. Thanks for watching continuing coverage of General Elections 2020 here at Town Meeting TV. Stay tuned. We'll be back with the candidates from South Burlington. Thanks for watching.